overblown in, in, introduction and, and to yourself and, and to Dahi for inv arranging such an interesting event, first instance, and for inviting me to speak at it. It's actually, it's about almost 18 months since I spoke at an institute event last, and that was in the in immediate aftermath of the bailout deal with the Troika. The Troika, that combination of the European Commission and the IMF in liaison with the ECB. Engagement with the Troika has certainly generated a lot more Europe in the financial affairs of Ireland. And that's my topic today. I want to talk about more Europe in the financial arena and ask whether it's good for Ireland. And there's a dimension which is Europe as a whole, and it's a dimension of more European involvement in Irish financial affairs. <clears throat> so I'll come back to the, the, the Troika and the, and the program, but first of all, I want to harken back to earlier days. One of the two inaugural publications of the Institute back in 1991, a study entitled Economic and Monetary Union, explored the implications of the French freshly minted draft Maastricht Treaty which laid the foundations, the constitutional foundations, for EMU. A study, if you dig out an old copy, goes into the question of whether bank supervision should remain at the national level in the new monetary union, and concludes that, and I quote, an opportunity may be missed, arguably a centralized bank supervision authority, whether a department of the ECB or a separate entity with wide powers would be more able to operate above national political pressures in acting decisively to prevent a failing bank from continuing to operate in an unsound manner. There would, the study astutely goes on to observe, of course be a need to retain a local-based inspection system for supplying the local field which is essential for detecting the early warning signs of distress. But so far as action to restrain unsound banking practices is concerned, here again, as in the case of monetary management, it may be worthwhile for national governments to cede power to the centre in order to save them from themselves." End of quote. Well, it seems from the banking part of what I'll call the Four Presidents Report, this week's report, uh, Van Rompuy and, and the other presidents of, of three, three presidents of the European institutions, a report which is remarkably entitled Towards a Genuine Economic and Monetary Union. It's a very remarkable title given uh, what's been happening in Europe for the last 20 years. I think we can see from that and from this morning's summit statement that this Two decade old ideas time has finally come. At last, there is a clear push towards integrated banking supervision with ultimate authority at the European level enforcing a common rule book. Of course, a significant national component of supervisory activity would continue, and probably extensive cross border use of national supervisory capacity for Ireland, both outward and inward. Our inspectors going there their inspectors coming here. That would likely be a conspicuous part of the supervision of banks in the years ahead. The other two banking elements of the four presidents proposed integrated financial framework, formerly known as the Banking Union, namely the establishment of a bank, European bank resolution scheme and a European deposit insurance scheme could help break for the future the damaging link between bank failure in smaller countries, and the taxpayer burden in those countries. In particular, centralized resolution, combined with the European Commission's recent proposals on bailing in uninsured bank creditors, would clearly ensure that what happened in Ireland would not be repeated elsewhere in the future. So it may not be popular these days in some circles here to speak favorably of more Europe, but in this arena of financial integration, at least, I therefore believe there is very little by way of threat to Ireland in moving forward, and rather, there's quite a lot to gain. Indeed, the Irish experience points rather clearly to the need for measures along these lines. An opportunity for coherence in system design was missed in 91 by the architects of the Euro area. It should be seized now. Of course, there will be practical and political difficulties, and the four presidents' report leaves many critical decisions unanswered, but the broad direction is established. 
Well, it remains to be seen whether the initiatives in this direction, banking supervision, deposit insurance, and resolution, will be enough in themselves to reassure markets, sufficiently narrowing again the spreads on government debt to the tight range that was observed throughout almost all of the first decade of the euro. There is, of course, much more in the Four Presidents' Report than just the proposals on financial integration. Specifically, that report also covers the large areas of integration for budgetary and economic policy frameworks and a strengthening of democratic legitimacy and accountability. I'll not go into those matters here, but all in all, it is to be expected that while designing and adhering to such a roadmap is surely necessary to rebuild both market and especially intergovernmental confidence, it may take time for market yields to converge to the extent desired. There has been already some market movement in the last uh, few hours. Recall, in thinking about these, this issue of, of yields on government bonds, recall that one of the Maastricht criteria for admission to the euro area is that a country's long-term bond yields should be not more than 200 basis points, two percentage points, above the average for the three countries with the lowest inflation rates. So that's the way the architects envisaged. You can't get in until you've, at least you've got your, your long-term yields to that sort of level. Well, yesterday, Spanish long-term yields reached about 550 basis points above those of Germany. The figure for Italy was more than 450 basis points. Clearly, these market conditions relating to three of the four largest countries are not what was envisaged by the Delors Committee way back then and are not consistent with the integrated monetary transmission called for in the treaty. This has to be corrected and quickly. What has been going on to generate these high spreads? Well, here's one oversimplified take on it, but one that I think conveys some of the reality. Even very high national debt ratios in the euro area can be seen by the markets as tolerable as long as interest rates are low. And interest rates were indeed low throughout the euro area before the crisis. The low interest rate environment owed much to the effective and credible control over inflation rates that had come into effect and represented such a welcome relief for many countries relative to what had been experienced in the high inflation of the 70s and 80s. Introduction of the euro ensured low interest rates in the low debt countries, but low yields also prevailed in the high debt countries as long as markets thought that the debt levels were tolerable and that the debt would be repaid without any doubt. Even for countries to which the rating agencies did not attach a high credit rating, sovereign debt traded for most of the first decade of EMU as if it was AAA or close. But the same very high debt ratios do not appear so tolerable if interest rates are high. And alas, markets will demand higher interest rates if the debt does not appear tolerable. This vicious circle has gripped half a dozen euro area countries with a vengeance. Indeed, now the spreads again seem out of line with credit ratings, but this time the range of spreads is wider than the ratings would normally imply. A sense that countries in trouble would eventually be bailed out, despite treaty prohibitions, may also be, have been at work in keeping debt levels low in the past, but that belief too has been eroded by the market's experience with the Greek PSI debt exchange. Of course, by piling up debt in many euro area countries, some of which were already high, some not so high, the fiscal and banking policy responses to the crash of 2008-9, counter-cyclical fiscal policy, and the assumption of the obligations of failing banks, have contributed to moving countries from safety into the risk zone where the good equilibrium, low interest rates, low perceived default risk, could flip and has flipped into the bad equilibrium of high interest rates and less certainty. Getting debt ratios back to moderate levels is the medium-term solution, but that takes time. Breaking the vicious circle should be possible even in the short run. A number of techniques is available, but to do so in a way that is broadly acceptable across Europe and in a way that maintains overall stability in other dimensions requires the steps adumbrated by the four presidents. 
this morning's summit pushes the process forward. Until this vicious circle is convincingly broken and a more sustainable configuration of bond yields is restored, financial market conditions will continue to appear fragile. And that's why there's increasing recognition that it is not something to be left on the long finger. Yet it's come back to Ireland. Ireland's financial interactions with Europe also relate, of course, more specifically to the Troika financing and the programme of adjustment, which is now about halfway through. When I spoke to the Institute last in January 2011, it was, as I mentioned, with an analysis of where the programme at its introduction situated Ireland. I pointed out that Ireland faced a serious problem of excessive indebtedness, public and private, and that the programme would not solve this, but would give time for Ireland to deal with the level of debt. I pointed out that tail risk in the banks remained high and that the EU and IMF had not been able to include in the programme any financial instruments that would help insulate Ireland from tail risk. The hope had to be that tail risks would not materialise. Well, these two issues, high public debt and the working out of the bank's distressed loans, remain central. Progress has been made, but more is needed. Let me speak first about the public finances and public debt, and then about the banks. In both aspects, Ireland's interaction with Europe and the rest of the world is a, generally is a crucial part of the story, but a lot is homegrown also. With regard to the public finances, clearly the aftermath of the bank-driven boom and bust is the context for everything. Still, it's convenient to turn, in turn to separate in our minds the sums arising directly from the recapitalization of the banks and those related to the rest of the evolution of the public finances. So just a few words about recapitalizing the banks. The government has now injected sums equivalent to over 50% of this year's GNP into the Irish controlled banks. About half of this has been a cash injection and the rest is in deferred form, promissory notes and, and conventional government bonds. Until these deferred amounts are settled in cash, and I know that Carl Whelan has been talking a bit about this earlier today, the cash needs of IBRC, the legacy institution from Anglo and INBS, are being met with some 42, nearly 42 billion of exceptional liquidity assistance from the Central Bank of Ireland. The drawings of the Central Bank on the Euro system that in effect meet this ELA uh, are subject to remuneration at the ECB policy rate currently 1%. As long as these arrangements continue then, they have a sizable impact on the gross and especially the net debt of the state but the overall running cost to Ireland has been relatively low, thanks to the indulgence, in this matter at any rate, of what is often locally a, a, the oft-maligned ECB. Although this financing arrangement continues for the time being, still, from the market's point of view, the lack of any explicit commitment to long-term, low-cost financing of IBRC's cash needs no doubt has represented one of the obstacles to Ireland regaining market access on the necessary scale in the immediate future. With last night's summit statement, it may not be unrealistic to hope that this important loose end can be tied up relatively soon. At the Central Bank of Ireland, our initial approach to the recapitalization of Irish banks back in late 2009 was to imagine putting in not just enough capital, but so much capital as to fully dispel any market concerns. If we can look at the next, I have just a few slides. If we can look at the first of them there. The, the rapidly mounting, oh, I have to do something, do I? Yes, I actually have to do something. Come on. <laughs> the rapidly mounting actual and prospective public debt ratios coming from the non-banking deficit, and you can see the solid part of that line rising, that's the debt ratio rising 2008, 2009, 2010, even if you don't look at the banking debt, which is the white bit at the top. The rapidly mounting actual and prospective public debt ratios coming from the non-banking deficit meant that given the scale of the prospective banking losses that were announced in September 2010, well, they put pay to the idea of overcapitalizing the banks over the capitalizing the banks under such circumstances would simply have destabilized the state. And that's why we were reluctant, as I said the last time I was here, to 
to endorse further accumulation of indebtedness of the state in order to recapitalize the banks to insulate the financial system and the economy against tail risks. Even if external insurance was not available, and it wasn't, direct injection of the capital from external sources would have been a much better solution. However, as has been seen again with the case of Spain in the last weeks, until very recently, and things may have changed now, this was simply not on offer, limiting the possibility for decoupling the pressures of the banking system from those of the sovereign. Well, I could go on about, um, about I, there's too much here about bank capital. I'll, I'll skip down a little bit. Loan losses. As I stressed here 18 months ago, loan loss projections following a big bust involve an irreducibly large element of uncertainty. At the Central Bank, we continue to research the determinants of loan losses. Economic conditions, including house prices facing the borrowing firms and households, are not the only determinants. And as we have been stressing in other fora, the effectiveness of the bank's engagement with their stressed borrowers, as well as the leg legislative and administrative framework for dealing with insolvency, are important factors. And details of the new legislative framework for insolvency have been announced uh, by the government this morning. It should not be thought a paradox that a more engaged and holistic approach by banks and a less rigid and costly insolvency framework can help reduce loan losses over time. Meanwhile, given the final view of the Troika lenders that only the holders of subordinated debt and not of senior debt could be required to share in the losses, the additional capital requirements uh, brought the total state injection from 47 billion to, well, by my count, 64 billion. I think Carl disagrees, says it's only 63, but I think it's 64. Almost all of the unguaranteed senior bonds of IBRC have now been repaid. The last big chunk was paid this week. By now, the Irish government has provided about half of the capital requirements generated by the crisis. I think this is an interesting slide. Um, it's hard to get this in a completely consistent way, but I've broken down the costs of the capital injections into banks into what the government spent. That's the blue bit on the left, almost a half. The green bit at the top is it's called liability management exercises. These are the losses to subordinated debt holders. So their debt holders did suffer. Some, some people would have wanted them to suffer more, but 14 billion. Uh, the next one, the red one, is the losses in accounting terms by the shareholders. Anybody remember their bank share certificates? <laughs> Accounted for uh, that large, largest chunk of the total losses. And the orange bit is the cost to the shareholders of the foreign owned banks. So I think that's quite an interesting picture of, of where those banking losses uh, fell. Away from the banks now, and, and, and let's talk about um, the rest of the government's fiscal accounts very briefly. So far, I haven't spoken much about the adjustment of spending and taxation, what's now being called austerity. Let's be clear about this. When Ireland lost access to the markets, the availability of borrowed funds depended on the foreign official lenders they have authorized sufficient funds for what has to be described as a rather gradual glide path of the government deficit, certainly relative to the alternative of no access, but also relative to what is being implemented in other countries, such as Britain, Spain, and the United States, many others, but I just chose those three, despite the much lower debt ratios in those countries. So is Ireland... Uh, is there a fiscal crunch in Ireland that is, is faster than countries that are, are, are not in programs? Evidently not. Uh, just let's look at that slide briefly. On the left-hand side, uh, on the, the, uh, the y-axis, the percentage, government deficit as a percent of GDP. I leave out the banking parts of the, of the Irish deficit. And you can see in 2009 there, the green curve, of course, the thick green curve is Ireland. Uh, the, the one that starts at 13% is the United States, the red one is the United Kingdom, and the blue one is Spain. And what I want you to get out of this uh, chart is how relatively gradual the Irish 
decline in, its, in the deficit right through to 2013 is. So that although it was uh, well below the US at the start, it, it is above all of them at the end, and it's, it, it's a lot above Spain, which despite not being in a program, is adopting a much tougher adjustment. And uh, it, it, the, uh, the British program also gives Britain a much lower deficit in 2013. It's important then in, 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 to recognize that the availability of public official financing has protected the Irish uh, government accounts and has allowed the, the, the adjustment to be a lot slower. Indeed, the striking fact is that right through to the end of the program, there is a resource transfer from the official lenders to support non-interest net spending of the Irish government. It is only after the end of the program's scheduled term that Ireland is expected to be actually reducing the government debt ratio. As such, it can fairly be said that the higher taxes and cuts in public spending are, thus far, not being used to pay off the banking debt. The scale of the fiscal adjustment needed even then is an indication of how badly skewed our public finances had become in the boom with what proved to be transitory revenues used to increase the level of spending above, well above what could be sustained. Achieving fiscal targets is easier when the economy grows. More important, there are more jobs and more income to go around when the economy grows. In the face of weakening economic activity in many parts of the Euro area, there has been a tendency for international comment to consider the Irish economy's current growth performance as rather good. Export growth, the current account surplus in the balance of payments, compliance with budgetary targets, and improvements in cost competitiveness are rightly emphasized. But emphasis is sometimes also placed on indicators such as aggregate productivity and unit labor costs, which in Ireland can flatter. In fact, after the very steep fall during the crash of 2008-9, economic activity, aggregate economic activity, has been broadly unchanged since early 2009. Growth in export-oriented sectors has been offset by shrinkage in domestic demand. Only in 2013 does the central bank expect the domestic demand to stop falling. Aggregate employment has been falling for five years now. Bank lending, despite all of the policy efforts, remains timid. Despite the fact that exports have held up, adverse economic factors have been holding the Irish economy back. It's one of the most open in the world, and so it's important what the external factors are doing. For example, compared to what was projected at the outset of the program, economic activity in Ireland, GDP, is almost 2% below what was expected at the outset of the program. But this gels with an average underperformance of the rest of the EU economy of about the same percentage. We pull this out here. If we, we can probably, the easiest thing is to forget about the red bars. And this shows you revisions to the growth forecast for 2012, the blue lines, the revision that happened be, between early 2011 and, and recent forecasts. So you can see on the right-hand side there, there's Ireland, almost 2% below. But look at all the other countries, some of them as high as uh, between 3 and 4%, Spain and Italy, uh, Germany, also 1.5% relative to what was expected. The euro area as a whole, rather more than 2% below what was expected at that time. So that shows you the link between external, uh, the external situation, or it, or, or it suggests the link between the external situation and Ireland the continued high rate of personal savings and the fiscal adjustment have also been external, uh, have also been adverse factors. Though as I mentioned, the latter factor has been minimized thanks to the availability of Troika funding. Any overall assessment must therefore be highly qualified. Though there have been several setbacks in the Euro area and some missed opportunities, step-by-step -step actions have been taken to build the conditions needed to ensure a stronger recovery of the Irish economy. According to the forecasters, a return to output and employment growth is in sight, and while there will no doubt be some more setbacks on the way, it's not unreasonable to hope that the balance of negative and positive surprises will be better than it was. However, the high and still growing debt is reflected in the yield spreads, even if they've come down today. Financing conditions do need to be improved, as has been acknowledged, as has been acknowledged 
in this latest summit this morning. While some may have hoped for more from Europe in the past couple of years, any fair-minded assessment must acknowledge that the official financing received has been a lifeline. If financial markets and growth conditions in Europe can indeed be stabilised, and I'm sure they can, if financing conditions for Ireland can be improved, and if restraint remains the policy watchword at home, the corner can soon be turned. Thank you very much.